Elvis Presley died today. He was 42. Apparently, it was a heart attack. Every generation witnesses an artist who defines its era, and Elvis Presley was such a figure. Universally acclaimed as the king of rock and roll, he rose to prominence in the 1960s, earning three Grammy Awards and captivating audiences worldwide. Despite his tragic early death, Elvis's final moments and heartfelt wishes offer insight into the man behind the music. Today, we explore the life, career, and untimely demise of this legendary icon. Early Years Born on January 8, 1935 in Tupelo, Mississippi, Elvis Aaron Presley entered the world to Vernon Presley and Gladys Love Presley. Unfortunately, his twin brother, Jesse Guerin, was stillborn. Despite this loss, Elvis grew up in close connection with both parents, particularly bonding with his mother. Their family attended an Assembly of God church, which sparked Elvis's early passion for music. Life was challenging for the Presleys. Vernon, Elvis's father, struggled to make ends meet with various odd jobs, and the family frequently relied on assistance from neighbors and government aid. Their hardships reached a peak in 1938 when Vernon was convicted of check fraud, resulting in an eight-month jail sentence and the loss of their home. In September 1941, Elvis began first grade at East Tupelo Consolidated School, where he was deemed average by his teachers. His first taste of public performance came at the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show in October 1945, where, at the age of 10, he sang Old Shep and placed fifth. Shortly after, he received his first guitar as a birthday gift, sparking his interest in music even further. Elvis began to learn to play, receiving lessons from family members and church pastors. By September 1946, Elvis had moved on to Milam School for sixth grade. It was here that he started to showcase his musical talents, singing and playing guitar at school events. Despite facing teasing for his love of what some considered hillbilly music, Elvis remained dedicated to his passion. He found inspiration in Mississippi Slim's radio show, eagerly soaking up chord techniques taught by Slim's younger brother. At the age of 12, Elvis was given the opportunity to perform on air twice by Mississippi Slim. Overcoming his initial stage fright, he made his debut and began to pave the way for his legendary career ahead. In November 1948, the Presley family made the significant move to Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis enrolled at L.C. Humes High School, where he encountered a mixed reception. Despite receiving a mediocre grade in music class, his passion for singing was undeniable. When his music teacher doubted his abilities, Elvis proved him wrong by belting out, keep them cold icy fingers off me, with his guitar in hand. However, his shyness often held him back, and he occasionally faced taunting from peers who labeled him a mama's boy. In 1950, Elvis's musical journey took a more structured turn when he began taking guitar lessons from a neighbor named Lee Denson. Together with three other boys, including the Burnett brothers, future rockabilly icons, Elvis formed an informal musical group, laying the groundwork for his future endeavors. As Elvis progressed through high school, he started to carve out his identity, particularly in his junior and senior years. He began to stand out from his peers, not only through his musical talents, but also through his distinctive appearance. Growing his sideburns and adopting a stylish hairstyle, he drew inspiration from the vibrant blues scene on Beale Street, admiring the flashy attire at Lansky Brothers. By his senior year, Elvis had fully embraced this bold fashion sense. In 1953, Elvis took a bold step by participating in Hume's annual minstrel show. Despite his previous struggles and lack of popularity in school, his performance of Till I Waltz Again With You by Teresa Brewer proved to be a game changer. The unexpected revelation of his singing talent earned him newfound respect and popularity among his peers, marking a pivotal moment in his journey toward stardom. Early Career In August 1953, Elvis Presley ventured into the Memphis Recording Service, overseen by Sam Phillips before the establishment of Sun Records. His mission? To secure studio time and record a two-sided acetate disc featuring My Happiness and That's When Your Heartaches Begin. Initially, Presley claimed the endeavor was a birthday gift for his mother, while later asserting he was simply curious about his own vocal abilities. Biographer Peter Goralnik suggested that Presley's choice of Sun Records was fueled by aspirations of being discovered. In January 1954, Presley returned to Sun Records to cut another acetate, this time featuring I'll Never Stand in Your Way and It Wouldn't Be the Same Without You. Unfortunately, this effort also failed to yield any significant results. Around the same time, he faced setbacks, 
including unsuccessful auditions for the local vocal quartet, the Songfellows, and Eddie Bond's band. Meanwhile, Sam Phillips remained vigilant for a talent capable of bringing the soulful sound of black musicians to a wider audience, a sound Sun Records was keen on promoting. In June, Phillips stumbled upon a demo recording by Jimmy Sweeney of the ballad Without You, which he believed might suit Presley's vocal style. Although Presley struggled with the song during his studio visit, Phillips recognized his potential and invited him to explore other numbers. Presley's breakthrough moment came during a recording session on July 5th, when, after a string of unsuccessful takes, he spontaneously launched into Arthur Crudup's That's All Right. Energized by Presley's performance, guitarist Scotty Moore and bassist Bill Black joined in, creating the distinctive sound that Phillips had been searching for. Captivated, Phillips began recording immediately. Just three days later, Memphis DJ Dewey Phillips debuted That's All Right on his Red Hot and Blue show. The response was overwhelming, with listeners clamoring for more. During an on-air interview with Presley, Dewey Phillips clarified to his audience that Presley was white, dispelling assumptions that he was African-American due to his unique sound. In the following days, Presley, Moore, and Black returned to the studio to record Blue Moon of Kentucky, infusing it with their signature style and utilizing an innovative echo effect coined Slapback by Sam Phillips. The resulting single, featuring That's All Right on the A-side and Blue Moon of Kentucky on the reverse, marked the beginning of Elvis Presley's meteoric rise to stardom. On July 17, 1954, the trio comprising Elvis Presley, Scotty Moore, and Bill Black made their public debut at the Bon Air Club, marking the beginning of a transformative chapter in music history. Just days later, they took to the stage at the Overton Park Shell, where Elvis introduced his now famous rubber legs dance move, a spontaneous fusion of rhythm and nerves that captivated audiences. With his wide cut pants accentuating his energetic movements, Elvis's performances ignited screams of excitement from young female fans, setting the stage for his meteoric rise. Moore vividly recalled the electrifying effect Elvis had on crowds, with his dynamic stage presence and infectious energy. As they continued to perform together, Moore and Black parted ways with their previous band to join Elvis full-time, while Bob Neal stepped in as their manager, guiding them through their burgeoning career. From August to October, they became a fixture at the Eagle's Nest Club in Memphis, drawing swarms of teenagers who eagerly packed the venue to catch a glimpse of the rising star. Elvis's confidence on stage blossomed with each performance as he intuitively connected with his audience and experimented with new moves that elicited enthusiastic responses. Amidst their relentless live schedule, Elvis returned to Sun Studio for further recording sessions, fueling the momentum of his burgeoning career. However, his attempt to break into the country music scene met with mixed results when he made a one-time appearance on Nashville's Grand Ole Opry, with the manager expressing lukewarm interest in his performance. Despite this setback, Elvis's journey was just beginning, with his raw talent and magnetic charisma poised to propel him to unprecedented heights in the world of music. In November 1954, Elvis Presley took to the stage of the Louisiana Hayride, a formidable rival to the Grand Ole Opry, broadcasting to a vast audience across 198 radio stations in 28 states. His initial performance was met with nerves, garnering a tepid response from the crowd. However, his second set, marked by newfound confidence and energy, sparked an enthusiastic reaction, leading to a significant breakthrough. Following his successful appearance, Presley secured a year-long contract with the Louisiana Hayride, embarking on a series of Saturday night performances. Trading in his old guitar for a Martin instrument, he and his trio expanded their reach, playing in new locales such as Houston, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas. Additionally, Presley made his television debut on KSLA-TV's broadcast of the Louisiana Hayride, laying the groundwork for broader exposure. Despite failing an audition for Arthur Godfrey's talent scouts on CBS television, Presley's career trajectory remained on an upward trajectory. By early 1955, his regular appearances on the Louisiana Hayride, extensive touring, and well-received record releases solidified his status as a regional star. In January, Presley's manager, Bob Neal, signed a formal contract with him and introduced him to Colonel Tom Parker, a renowned music promoter. Parker, impressed by Presley's potential, booked him on a tour with country music stars Eddie Arnold and Hank Snow, further elevating his profile. By August, Sun Records had released 10 tracks credited to Elvis Presley, Scotty and Bill, 
showcasing a blend of musical styles ranging from R&B to country. This fusion, later dubbed Rockabilly, initially struggled to find radio airplay due to its unique sound, but it captured the attention of audiences with its infectious rhythm and energy. Despite encountering jealousy and hostility from some quarters, Presley's popularity continued to soar, prompting him to renew his management contract with Neil and appoint Parker as a special advisor. The addition of drummer Fontana to the trio expanded their sound, while advice from Bill Haley encouraged Presley to focus on rhythm-driven songs rather than ballads. In November, Presley was voted the most promising male artist at the Country Disc Jockey Convention, attracting the attention of major record labels. Eventually, Parker and Phillips struck a groundbreaking deal with RCA Victor, acquiring Presley's son contract for a record-breaking $40,000. With legal issues handled by Presley's father, RCA began heavily promoting their new signing, reissuing many of his son recordings and laying the groundwork for his ascent to superstardom. Iconic Rise and Recognition On January 10, 1956, Elvis Presley ventured into RCA Victor's Nashville studio for his inaugural recording session with the label. Joined by his trusted ensemble of Scotty Moore, Bill Black, DJ Fontana, and pianist Floyd Kramer from the Louisiana Hayride, RCA Victor expanded the lineup to include renowned guitarist Chet Atkins and background singers like Gordon Stoker of the Jordan Ayres Quartet. The result of this session was the hauntingly captivating Heartbreak Hotel, which hit the shelves as a single on January 27, marking a significant milestone in Presley's career. Colonel Tom Parker, ever the savvy promoter, secured Presley's television debut on CBS's stage show, where he made six appearances over two months, captivating audiences with his electrifying performances. The recording sessions didn't stop there. Immediately after his first appearance, Presley headed to RCA Victor's New York studio to record eight tracks, including a rendition of Carl Perkins' iconic rockabilly anthem, Blue Suede Shoes. By February, Presley's son recording, I Forgot to Remember to Forget, soared to the top of the Billboard country chart, further cementing his rising star status. In a strategic move, Parker took over management duties from Bob Neal, and RCA Victor released Presley's eponymous debut album on March 23rd. Bursting with energy and innovation, the album featured a blend of country, pop, and the defining sound of rock and roll, including covers of Little Richard, Ray Charles, and The Drifters. This groundbreaking album not only topped the Billboard chart, but also reshaped the perception of the guitar as the quintessential instrument of rock and roll. Presley's impact extended beyond the airwaves. His appearances on The Milton Berle Show and a harrowing flight to Nashville underscored his growing influence and popularity. Heartbreak Hotel clinched the number one spot on the pop charts after 12 weeks, solidifying Presley's position as a cultural phenomenon. As Presley's fame soared, he embarked on a residency at the New Frontier Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, where his performances initially met with mixed reviews from the conservative audience. Undeterred, Presley's theatrical flair and dynamic stage presence left an indelible mark, paving the way for future successes. Amidst his burgeoning music career, Presley ventured into acting, signing a seven-year contract with Paramount Pictures. His tour of the Midwest showcased his versatility as an entertainer, with his rendition of Hound Dog, inspired by Freddie Bell and the Bell Boys cover, becoming a show-stopping finale. With each milestone, Elvis Presley's impact continued to reverberate, shaping the very fabric of popular culture and solidifying his position as the unrivaled king of rock and roll. On June 5th, during his second appearance on the Milton Berle show at NBC's Hollywood studio, Presley found himself amidst another whirlwind tour. Despite Milton Berle's advice to leave his guitar backstage, Presley took to the stage with his signature swagger. However, it was his rendition of Hound Dog that would ignite a firestorm of controversy. In a daring move, Presley transformed the upbeat tempo of Hound Dog into a slow, provocative performance punctuated by exaggerated body movements and gyrations. This departure from convention sparked outrage and debate across the nation. Critics, including Jack Gould of the New York Times and Ben Gross of the New York Daily News, lambasted Presley's performance, labeling it as devoid of musical merit and laden with suggestive, vulgar undertones. Even Ed Sullivan, whose variety show was a mainstay of family entertainment, deemed Presley unfit for family viewing, effectively banning him from his program. Unfazed by the criticism, but displeased with the derogatory moniker Elvis the Pelvis, Presley dismissed such labels as childish. Despite the backlash, 
Presley's provocative stage presence only served to fuel his legend, cementing his status as a cultural icon whose influence transcended music. Elvis Presley's appearances on television continued to captivate audiences and drive cultural conversation, solidifying his status as a phenomenon and sparking a transformative shift in popular culture. Following the success of his appearances on shows like Milton Berle and Steve Allen, Presley made his highly anticipated debut on The Ed Sullivan Show on September 9, 1956. Hosted by actor Charles Lawton due to Sullivan's absence, the show attracted a staggering 60 million viewers, a record-breaking 82.6% of the television audience. Sullivan, wary of Presley's controversial stage presence, famously insisted on filming him only from the waist up to maintain the show's family-friendly image. Return back to career. Presley returned to the U.S. in 1960, receiving an honorable discharge and thrilling crowds with impromptu appearances along his journey. He quickly returned to the music scene, recording hits like Stuck On You and Are You Lonesome Tonight in Nashville, leading to the acclaimed album Elvis Is Back. His success continued with a groundbreaking television performance on the Frank Sinatra Timex special and chart-topping albums like G.I. Blues and His Hand in Mine. After the song's release, Parker directed Presley toward a demanding film schedule, focusing on low-budget musical comedies after initial attempts at more serious roles disappointed commercially. Despite critical scorn, most of Presley's films in the 1960s were profitable, with producer Hal Wallace declaring them a Hollywood staple. Accompanying 15 films were full soundtrack albums, featuring a mix of ballads and blues, though quality declined over time. While some albums like Can't Help Falling in Love found success, Presley's overall commercial appeal diminished, with only one top 10 hit from 1964 to 1968. In 1966, after more than seven years of courtship, Elvis Presley proposed to Priscilla Beaulieu. Their eagerly anticipated union finally took place in 1967. However, at this time, Presley's career was entering a challenging phase. Criticism mounted, particularly following the commercial disappointment of the Clambake soundtrack, marking a significant downturn in his professional trajectory. In 1968, amid dissatisfaction with his career, Presley welcomed his daughter Lisa Marie while struggling with chart performance and declining album sales. Seeking a turnaround, his manager Parker negotiated a deal with NBC for a televised special. Recorded in Burbank, California, the special, later known as the 68 Comeback Special, aired in December and showcased Presley's return to the stage in electrifying performances clad in black leather. The special was a critical and commercial success, reigniting Presley's passion for music and inspiring a vow to prioritize artistic integrity. Buoyed by this, Presley recorded the acclaimed album From Elvis in Memphis in 1969, featuring hits like In the Ghetto and Suspicious Minds. After the success of the comeback special, Presley eagerly returned to live performances, securing a lucrative residency at the International Hotel in Las Vegas. Despite initial doubts, he assembled a new top-tier backing band and debuted a fresh stage look inspired by his love of karate. The Vegas comeback was met with overwhelming acclaim, leading to a lucrative five-year contract and critical praise likening his resurgence to a resurrection. In November, Presley's final non-concert film, Change of Habit, premiered alongside the release of the double album From Memphis to Vegas, From Vegas to Memphis, featuring live recordings from his Vegas performances. The single Suspicious Minds topped the charts, marking his first U.S. pop number one hit in over seven years. Throughout this period, Presley maintained a strong aversion to drugs and alcohol, a stance influenced by his family's history of addiction. In 1970, MGM documented Presley's performances at the International Hotel in Las Vegas for the film Elvis, That's the Way It Is. Despite receiving a threatening letter demanding money, his concerts proceeded safely, with Presley's iconic jumpsuit becoming a fixture of his stage presence. The accompanying album marked a departure from his root style toward mainstream pop. Later that year, Presley met with President Nixon, expressing his desire to combat drug culture among youth, showcasing his concern for societal issues. He was recognized for his contributions, receiving accolades from the U.S. Junior Chamber of Commerce and having a section of Highway 51 South renamed in his honor. In 1971, Presley released three studio albums, including Elvis Country, praised for its genre standards, and Elvis Sings the Wonderful World of Christmas, a commercial success blending traditional holiday tunes with Presley's energetic style. The following year, Presley starred in the documentary Elvis on Tour, 
earning acclaim, and released the gospel album He Touched Me, winning him another Grammy Award. He embarked on a historic tour, culminating in four sold-out shows at Madison Square Garden and his final top ten hit, Burning Love, Personal Life, Marriage Struggles. Presley's marriage to Priscilla had deteriorated significantly, with the couple growing increasingly distant and barely sharing a home. In 1971, Presley had an affair with Joyce Bova, unaware that she became pregnant and subsequently had an abortion. He even suggested the possibility of Joyce moving into Graceland. The marriage reached a breaking point on February 23, 1972, when Priscilla revealed her relationship with Mike Stone, a karate instructor recommended by Presley himself. Their confrontation turned physical, with Presley forcefully initiating intimacy, asserting his idea of masculinity. Priscilla later regretted her choice of words describing the incident, acknowledging it as an overstatement. Five months later, Presley began a relationship with Linda Thompson, a songwriter and former beauty queen, who moved in with him. The couple filed for divorce on August 18, 1972. The failure of his marriage was deeply impactful, with friends noting that Presley never fully recovered from it. At a rare press conference in June, Presley expressed the difficulty of reconciling his public image with his personal struggles, acknowledging the challenge of living up to the expectations placed upon him. In 1973, Presley performed benefit concerts and starred in the groundbreaking television special Aloha from Hawaii, broadcast globally via satellite. Despite paranoia and emotional turmoil, Presley's showmanship shone through, solidifying his status as a cultural icon and concluding with his last U.S. number one pop album during his lifetime, Medical Crises, and Last Studio Sessions. In October 1973, Elvis Presley's divorce was finalized, coinciding with a significant decline in his health. He experienced two overdoses on barbiturates that year, resulting in him spending three days in a coma after the first incident. Later in 1973, he was hospitalized due to the effects of a pethidine addiction. His primary care physician, Dr. George C. Nicopoulos, noted that Presley believed obtaining drugs from a doctor made him different from a typical drug addict buying drugs on the street. In 1973, despite declining health, Presley maintained a hectic concert schedule, performing 168 shows, his busiest year yet. However, his health issues became apparent during a September concert at the University of Maryland, where witnesses noted his visible discomfort, slurred speech, and physical weakness. Concerns grew among band members and fans alike. As his health deteriorated further, questions arose about the sustainability of his rigorous touring routine. Nevertheless, Presley embarked on another demanding tour in 1974, exacerbating his fragile condition. While Presley's interest in studio recordings waned, RCA became anxious about his output. Despite a productive session in December 1973, yielding enough material for two albums, Presley didn't officially record any studio material in 1974. Instead, RCA released a live album, Elvis Recorded Live on Stage in Memphis, featuring a Grammy-winning rendition of How Great Thou Art. Presley returned to the studio briefly in March 1975, but further attempts to organize sessions later that year failed. In 1976, RCA set up a mobile recording unit at Graceland for two recording sessions. Yet the process remained challenging for Presley amidst his declining health. As Elvis Presley's health deteriorated rapidly in early 1977, journalist Tony Sherman described him as a grotesque caricature of his former self, grossly overweight and mentally dulled by the drugs he consumed daily. His concerts became sad and sloppy affairs, with Presley struggling to remember lyrics and get through performances without collapsing. Andy Green of Rolling Stone remarked that the final years of Presley's life were marked by sadness and difficulty, with many performances being hard to watch. In one instance in Alexandria, Louisiana, Presley was nearly incomprehensible on stage. Despite his declining health, Presley fulfilled most of his touring commitments. Although fans expressed increasing disappointment with his performances, he became increasingly isolated, spending most of his time confined to his room and engrossed in spiritualism books. Presley's cousin, Billy Smith, recalled how he would spend hours chatting, often gripped by paranoid obsessions. Presley's last single release during his lifetime, Way Down, came out on June 6, 1977. CBS taped two concerts for a television special, Elvis in Concert, to be broadcast in October. The first concert, filmed in Omaha on June 19, 
showcased Presley's diminished voice and uncertain singing, while the second, in Rapid City, South Dakota, showed some improvement in his appearance and performance. However, by the end of the Rapid City show, Presley's face was soaked in sweat, and he appeared worn out. His final concert took place in Indianapolis at Market Square Arena on June 26, 1977, Elvis's last wish and its significance. In his final moments, Elvis Presley expressed a profound desire for inner peace and forgiveness, a longing that surpassed the trappings of fame and fortune. His poignant inquiry about divine forgiveness to Billy encapsulated this deep yearning, reflecting his quest for solace within himself and with his creator. This wish sheds light on the spiritual dimension of Elvis's life, often overshadowed by his rock and roll persona. Raised in the Assembly of God Church, gospel music deeply influenced him, and he frequently turned to the Bible for comfort amidst life's trials. Elvis's spiritual journey was not a passing interest, but a core aspect of his identity, in conflict with the allure of fame. His longing for forgiveness mirrors the internal struggle between guilt and redemption, stemming from personal battles like addiction and the moral dilemmas fame presented. His desire for peace and forgiveness reveals his humanity, challenging the idolized image often associated with him. Elvis, like any person, grappled with existential questions, seeking meaning beyond worldly success as he confronted mortality. On a broader scale, Elvis's wish resonates with universal human experiences, echoing our shared yearnings for acceptance and tranquility in life's twilight. Death and Legacy On August 16, 1977, Elvis Presley's life came to a sudden end at the age of 42. Scheduled for a tour, his fiancée, Ginger Alden, discovered him unresponsive in the bathroom of his Graceland mansion. Despite attempts to revive him, Presley was pronounced dead at Baptist Memorial Hospital later that afternoon. President Jimmy Carter acknowledged Presley's profound impact on American popular culture, recognizing his role in shaping its landscape. Following his passing, thousands gathered outside Graceland to pay their respects, with some resorting to sensationalism for profit. Presley's funeral took place at Graceland on August 18th, marred by tragedy as a car accident claimed the lives of two fans outside the gates. He was laid to rest beside his mother at Forest Hill Cemetery, with thousands lining the processional route. However, his resting place faced an attempted theft, leading to the exhumation and reburial of his remains alongside his mother in Graceland's meditation garden on October 2nd. In the weeks following his death, Presley's song Way Down soared to the top of charts in both the country and the UK. Presley's legacy resonates worldwide, with his name, image, and music remaining iconic symbols of popular culture. He inspires legions of impersonators and receives praise as one of the most significant figures in music history. Renowned artists such as Leonard Bernstein, John Lennon, and Bob Dylan have lauded Presley's transformative influence, hailing him as a cultural force and crediting him with revolutionizing music and shaping their own artistic journeys. Since his passing, numerous conspiracy theories have emerged, but Presley's enduring legacy remains untarnished. Fans continue to gather at Graceland and other sites associated with him, honoring his memory and cementing his status as a revered cultural icon beloved for his innovation and enduring charisma. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.